So I got a call. It was a uh, first Chris called me, my agent. He like, yo, what you you think about um, joining the Jordan national team? I'm like, I don't even know where Jordan at. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't, like Jordan, Michael Jordan. I'm thinking Michael Jordan. I, I go play for Michael Jordan for sure. Welcome back to Beyond the Buzzer, the podcast that examines the relationship between adversity, balance, and success off the court for high-performance athletes. I'm Abu Dial Katan. And I'm Sam Douglas. And today, we've got a great episode lined up for you guys. Today's guest is a bona fide hooper, a bucket, as we say in the basketball world. Dar Tucker, one of the only people I know that can shoot a pull-up jumper with his right hand and his left. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what's up, what's up, man? Welcome. I'm glad to be here, man. Dar joined the Jordan national team while I was the head coach and helped us qualify to the World Cup not once, but twice. Yeah, yeah, Dar yeah. also holds the single game scoring record in the G League with 58 points in a game. Beyond that, Dar's already decided to think about his life beyond the sport. And with that, makes him the perfect guest for our podcast. Welcome to the show, Dar. Hey, how y'all doing, man? Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here, baby. I'm very, very happy. But Dar... Honestly, did we miss anything? No. <laughs> no, it was, it, it was great. That was a great intro. Uh I think it I think it I think it represented me well. Dar, typically well. we start with like a little shot clock section where we ask a couple questions quick fire to okay. get the audience comfortable with you. But before we do that, today's a little bit unique. You played for Sam as a coach. What was it like playing for Coach Sam? Oh, there, there you go. <laughs> Out the rip, huh? Uh no, it was it was it was good. It was it was good. He was a uh, he's a player. He's a player's coach. You know what I mean. He understands the players. Uh, he know what he want. You know, it was first practice. He he told everybody they roll. He put us in a circle. And said, this what you do. This what you do. This what you do. And that was that. And um, I think everybody respected that. You can go and talk to him, not just on the court. You know, off the court too, because he understands. You know what I mean. He was a player, so. That was great for me, uh, especially at that time. You know what I mean? Just coming up young and having been, you know, over that way, you know, in the Middle East. And just to make that adjustment, you know, he helped a lot. We'll definitely get into Sam and his influence on the game and on your career as well. But let's let's go ahead and get that shot clock section started. We're going to try and get through as many questions as we can in three minutes. <laughs> Dar, what was the highlight of your career so far? Having my son. I like that. What's your morning routine? Get up, brush my teeth. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Nike or Adidas? Because <laughs> because because Adidas Adidas coming with some fire right now. Like, right. You know what I'm saying? They coming with some fire. I'm gonna go with uh. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna go with Nike. Man. I'm gonna go with Nike. They got a lot more stuff. Answer. What's your go-to cheat meal? So they got waffles here. That's pretty good. <laughs> I've been kind of going crazy on the waffles here. Best player you ever played with? Oh, Wilson Chandler. Uh, Wilson Chandler. Wilson Chandler. Yeah, that was one of the, one of the best I played with. Favorite sports movie? Um, remember the Titans. Hardest team you ever played against? I'm going to say the first year. What year was that when we played, uh, man, Iran? Oh, Iran. That was 2017. Yeah. 2017 Iran national team. That was one of those. They were just all good. Like that starting five was crazy. What's the worst loss you ever took? <laughs> in college, uh, in college against who was that? UConn. I think we lost by like four, 40. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jordan national team against Can Canada. Ooh. Probably one of the longest games I ever, I ever played. It was just like, I swear it was like four hours, and we getting beat by like fifty. It was like, just had to watch it. It was crazy, man. All time favorite player. So I'm going with Jordan. That's my goat. But I'm a Kobe fan. That's my. Double I got up. Kobe there. Sam, Sam's <laughs> acting out right now because I'm on the wrong guy. We're going to. I'm a Kobe fan. I'm a Kobe fan. I got Kobe, you know, tatted on me, tattooed me on too. me. Me too. So, yeah. Me too. You know, if it's not Jordan, it's. 
It's Jordan one and Kobe one A. I'll, 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 let, I'll let that answer live to like the old age of you guys, but whatever. <laughs> um, if there's one result in your career that you could change, what would that be? That I didn't, uh, that I didn't get drafted. It don't bother me now, but it used to, you know, that I didn't get drafted because I felt like I was pretty good at coming out, you know, coming out of school. But I, I felt like it was just too early. You know what I mean? If I can go back and change that and do it how I how I should do it, I think uh, it will be a better result. Well, we're definitely going to get into that. Uh, before we do, Sam, any any reflections from this section of the, of the shot class that you want to talk about? I just want to go ahead and rub it in your face a little bit more that MJ's the go <laughs> and Kobe is the 1A. I'll take that any day of the week. Uh, no, honestly, um, uh, n- n- nothing much about, you know, him not getting drafted. I think uh, in college, he had a great college career. But like you said, it might have been just a little bit too young or just too early. Well, Dar, as we get into sort of the, the next section of our of our show, we will start to ask more questions about your experience as a hooper on and off the court, maybe your experience in the Middle East as well. But before we do any of that, Dar, tell us who you are, right, for our listeners that maybe don't know your story. I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, it's like an hour, hour, hour and a half maybe from um, Detroit, small city. Uh, so I'm a small city kid. Uh I went to Arthur Hill High School, graduated from there, and then I made it to DePaul uh, 2007. I graduated high school, so I'm kind of old now. Did two years at DePaul, uh, left to the NBA draft. Didn't get drafted as we you know, spoke of just a minute ago. Didn't get drafted. Just felt I was you know, too young and rushed it. Yeah, from there, I went, I went to the D-League which is the G League now. Had good success there uh, the two years I was there. After that, then made it to my first year overseas, and that was in France, France Pro B. But from there, from there, I just traveled different countries, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Mexico, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Jordan, China. You know what I mean? So it's been a... I've been a kind of a journeyman, <laughs> you know, I've been floating around. So, but it's, it's, it's been great. You know, I'm proud of my career. Um, I accomplished a lot of things, a lot of good yeah, things, you know, uh, was able to take care of my family. So I, I can't complain, man. It's a pretty good career for me. Dart, um, touch a little bit more about your childhood. You grew up in a tough city, blue collar city, although big names came out of that city, such as uh, Jason Richardson, Draymond Green, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of good talent came, coming out of that city. Tell me a little bit more about your childhood. How was it? And how were you able to pick up a basketball throughout the struggle through that neighborhood? So, yeah, like well, my, my city is, is little. So it's kind of uh, you're going to see everybody, no matter if y'all are beefing or y'all like each other. You, you know what I'm saying? You're going to run into them at some point. So that was kind of dangerous a lot for us, you know what I mean, going around. Like you said, it, it, it was a lot of talent came, came through there. Uh, Jason Richardson was like one of the first, you know, then Draymond followed up and they represented well, you know what I mean? But growing up there was just like like any other city, you know, any other city in, uh, in the States. Growing up with basketball, it was everything, you know. <laughs> I walked, sleep. It was all basketball. It wasn't nothing else. And that was my main focus on that coming up as a kid. And then, you know, being inspired by by Jason Richardson, you know, because we can touch him. You know what I'm saying? He was a he was a great inspiration for a lot of kids coming up, especially my age, because we we were we, we were able, you know, to 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 touch him, to really talk to him. He was always coming back, you know. He inspired a lot of kids. I think he helped a whole lot, a whole lot. You know, somebody like um, Draymond Green, I know he helped him a whole lot. You know what I mean? With him going to Michigan State, the same school, you know, and, and him just coming back and doing camps 
things of that nature. Yeah, so man. So shout out which, Jay Rich for all the, oh, all the yeah. guys that don't know Jay Rich. He's he's a hooper and he was, you know, electric back in the day before social media. Most definitely. I wanted to to tap in, right? So you, you have these these role models that have shown you that you can you can get from where you are to playing at a high level. Do you remember the first time you you realized that, you know, you can hoop and that this might be a career for you in a way out? Uh yeah, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think it I really started taking it serious, serious, maybe, maybe like eighth grade, eighth and ninth grade. I knew like, all right, you like, you like one of the top players in the, in, in the city. So, you know, that's where it started at in the city first because I was playing baseball. That was my first sport and uh, gradually just changed over to basketball. Uh, but most likely like, a for ninth grade is when I was like, all right, you know, because I you, you start to get ranked. It's a big thing in the in the, in the states to be ranked in uh in the city or the state in uh the nation. So once I once I got ranked in the state, my ninth grade year, and I ain't like it, but because <laughs> I was ranked kind of low, so. <laughs> I think I was ranked in the state. I probably was ranked like 45. Oh, wow. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, come on now. Like, I know Fuck I'm better here. than, yeah, I know I'm better than 45 people. Yo, come on now. Al although you did win the AAU, your seventh and eighth grade as a seventh and eighth grader, yeah. right? Yeah. You yeah, won the AAU I championship. I did. I did. We won a national championship in seventh, eighth grade. Do you feel that put you on the map a little bit? Uh, maybe, maybe. Or, or winning the high school championship put you more on the map. Which one? Winning, as far as like the state, winning the high school championship, I think put me on the map more. Okay. Just off of, uh, you know, that bigger stage. I think as kids, I think they didn't take it as serious. You know what I'm saying? I had some good guys on my team, so I wasn't the best guy the seventh, eighth grade, but my high school year, you know, I was the best guy even though I was only a sophomore, but I was the best guy on the team. So I think that put me up higher. I was actually like neck to neck with uh with a couple of guys. And uh, one of them is um, hooping, playing here in Lebanon, uh, Manny Harris. Manny Harris went to Michigan, right? Yeah, me and Manny Harris, we the same class. So we in Michigan history of... Uh, we got it's a it's a trophy that you get at the end of your senior year, Mr. Basketball. And he won. He won Mr. Basketball, but it's the closest in history by one point. Nobody ever got that close. It's me and him neck to neck. So he won Mr. Basketball. I won player of the year. So let's let's talk a little bit about your your playing style, right? So now you've as Sam said, you win a state championship in high school, you go, you play D one basketball. I mentioned it at the beginning, but for those who don't know, like to have a jump shot with both your hands is is fucking absurd to say the least. Like it doesn't exist anywhere in in the basketball world. So, what the fuck were you thinking, first of all, when you decided to shoot with both hands, and how have how has that been a part of your game all the way up, up until now? So a lot of a lot of people ask me that. Uh, so I tell them like, I never. This is nothing I practice. This is nothing I planned. I didn't. I never planned to uh, shoot with both hands. I never even thought like it'd be, you know, that effective. So I used to shoot like this when I was little. I just try to heave it just up. Pass. Yeah, yeah, I just try to <laughs> heave it up, and it just and it just been that since. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's just it's just about the comfortability that I have going to a certain side. You know, if I go into my right side and I can't get to the basket. You know, I feel comfortable just pulling up with my right. Once I knew it was effective, once I knew, like, guys is telling me, like, yourself, like, man, bro, like, you shoot, how the hell you shoot with both hands? Like, that's crazy. And, and, and teams and coaches telling me, like, man, we, that's in the scouting report. Like, bro, you you got that in the scouting report on you. Like, if he shoots with both hands, so don't be surprised if he do it. So Scouting report probably just said, Dar Tucker, bucket. No, no, <laughs> the, the, yo. The funny thing about the scouting report with Dar is they usually force him right. And he yeah, loves going right. You know what I it's mean? It's crazy. And it's all crazy, his mid-range, yeah. he shoots with his right. 
But all his threes and pull-up threes, he goes with the left. I remember when he first came to Jordan, and I'm watching, I'm like, I, during a shooting drill, what do I tell him? Shoot with your right or shoot with your left? I mean, like, how do you balance? Like, if if you're going to put up 500 (laughs) shots, are you going to put up 500 right and 500 left? Like, how do you do that? You know what I mean? It's it's just a habit. You know, it's it's a habit now. I don't even practice it. Like... Like I, I I will pull it out sometimes because just to show people like okay he really can shoot with that one you know what I'm saying he really can shoot is right but other than that I I don't really practice on it or nothing like that you know when I'm going through drills or something, I might do it a couple times just to be uh just to be silly but other than that <laughs> I'm shooting with my left uh Dart I know you talked about how Jason Richardson and Draymond Green affected the community a lot and you played AAU. Uh, I want to mention a name and I know this name helped you a lot, been around you almost your whole life. Uh, He's a friend and he's your agent and you also played for his AAU team, Chris Greer. Uh, Yeah. A great guy. I got to meet him when I was playing in China. And it's crazy how small the world is. And then when it's, I just I became a coach and decided to bring you over to Jordan, he's your agent. Speak a little bit more about what Chris has done to that community as well, because I know he's done a lot to that community and to a lot and helped a lot of players. Chris, man, he's, he's, he's like my pops. He's like my he's like my dad. Uh, I've been around him since, since I was like 13, 13 to 12, you know. And to this day, he helped a whole lot. You know, he he's not even from my city, but he's like from 30 minutes away. He's from Flint, Michigan. So, you know, for him to, you know, come over and, and pull kids and give them uh, exposure, you know, was great for us. You know what I mean? Cause us being a little city and people not knowing who players that come from my city it was it was great, you know what I mean. He helped a whole lot of people get into schools, all type of stuff, man. You know he was he was great, bro. That you know I got nothing but love for him. I own I own my career. For people that don't know Chris, Chris probably one of the strongest agents I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and yeah, he is most definitely. pro my player or the highway. It's either I get it, my player gets it his way, or it ain't gonna happen. That's one thing I loved about him. You know what I mean. Yes, sir. No, for a fact. So shout out to Chris. Yeah, for a fact, man. Like I said, man, he goes to bat for me, man. Like, or any or any of his clients, you know, he he gonna go in them rooms. He gonna work. Yeah, you know what I mean. You ain't got to worry about that with him. When you came out of DePaul and uh, you were undrafted. Uh, walk us through it. What, what what do you feel affected you of not getting drafted? Was it the way you played? Was it the numbers? Was it you leaving early? What do you think affected you from not getting drafted? I think I think it was a lot of things. I think it was all those all those things. You know what I mean? Me being young, not understanding the game and and picking up on things early. You know, thinking that oh, I, I still got time. I still got time. And then time goes, you know what I'm saying? It's that. It's um, just not being mature, mature enough, you know what I mean? It was a lot of things, bro. Working hard, you know, I, I tell I tell a lot of young guys, I didn't start working hard until like 27. I'm so happy you you mentioned that. I think I think it's like the most it's the most troubling thing when you think about being young and fit and being able to play five games in a row, but not taking care of your body the way exactly. you should have. Not putting in the hours you know you should have. Working hard doesn't mean you're fucking going a million miles an hour every no. single work session. It means you're like, let's say in the off season, you're picking one part of your game that you want to get better and you just develop that. Like Just being smart about it. And I feel like it never happens, you know? And that's what I was, you know, and that's what, that was my big thing. You know what I'm saying? That's how I feel like I don't think um, while I was drafted, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't work hard because I had the ability already. My ability, my skill set was leading me to this. You know, it got me here without really, 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 really tuning in and working hard. You know what I'm saying? And it showed, you know, as I look back at it, I, as I look back at it now, it, it, it showed, it, it showed in like workouts. 
you know, and and they look at that. You know, NBA scouts pick that up. You know, this is they this is their job to to scout you. And I'm sure, I'm sure that's what they would say. Probably like, man, he he's good, but the work ethic is is kind of you know so so. Dar, you mentioned 27 is when you kind of did figure it out and start to realize how much you have to put in. So what happened at that age that made you, you know, take your game a little more seriously? The Argentina League a year before and scoring all these points, I was thinking I was averaging like 26. And I get there. And the first thing, you know, the first thing, they, the coach came to me, hey, this ain't, this ain't last year. You're going to have to work. And I mean, we worked. And it was like, oh, you know, it it, it kind of hit a switch in me. Like, man, like this what really working is about. Like, and I'm talking about every day. I'm I'm eating right. I'm uh, cause we had a nutritionist and all that. So I'm eating right. Uh, I'm working out every day. I'm lifting weights every day. You know, not just big weights. I'm working on different type of muscles. And I'm like, man. And just seeing the results, which that would help me a whole lot, you know, and I ended up winning MVP that year too. But just looking back at it and and, and seeing the, uh, the work that I put in and then how I felt, you know, the whole year I felt great. And I'm like, this is what it is to work hard and really tune in on your game and not just playing. Dar, that is one thing I'm struggling with now that I am in uh, player development, owning my own academy and being around athletes. They get that whole thing mixed up. What does it mean to work hard? And they really believe that they can just make it off their talent, but they have no idea what it takes to be part of that top tier player. You know what I mean? And when I always break it down, I always talk about like a triangle where you want your team development aspect you want the player development aspect, and then you want your strength and conditioning aspect. And all of them together should be surrounded with your nutrition and your recovery and your rest. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? And athletes think they can just get by by, you know what, today I'm going to go ahead and work out and not have a structural workout. You know what, I'm going to stay up all night. I'm going to go ahead and eat whatever I want to. And I'm so happy a player like yourself, so successful, shared light on it, especially that you found this out at a later age, so close to where I found it. I know my career changed after I tore my ACL because I went to one of the best rehab recovery spots and they taught me how to deal with it. But it is so important, so viral for uh, people to be able to work out on their game and do it consistently. You know what I mean? It's not like a one month thing. This is, I, I was so athlete. You got to keep working on your grind till the day you give it up. I want to talk about what led you to move to France, to make that move to France, to go to Europe. Um, just, just to do something different. Uh, I did the D league two years. Uh, I went most improved, nothing happened, no 10 day. So I was like, you know, just told Chris, man, I just need something new. I need something new. Uh, I wanted to try the overseas thing. It was either France. Australia, and this is before Australia was what it is now. But and it was out of them two, and I chose uh, France, which which be a good uh, decision. You know, I mean, France top one of the top leagues. You played in France, Argentina, Beirut, Brazil. You've been all over. What was the hardest country? Or hard, hardest league, let's say. Uh, the hardest league, man. I'm gonna say Argentina. Argentina, you know they play both sides. You know players there play both sides of the both sides of the court. They not no days off. <laughs> no, no, no days off. off. No possessions off, man. Like you know, and that's their mindset. And they stick to that. Uh, Brazil was pretty tough, but it was more so tough because the coach more so. Dart, you know, for you, it's like this remarkable journey that your basketball takes you around the world, right? Like you, like you said, you were born in a, in, in Michigan, and uh-huh. you know, a couple of years later, you're flying around the world playing basketball, doing what you love. But sometimes, on the flip side of that, 
a lot of teams and and sometimes find it difficult to really immerse with their American players that come in, right? Because it's like all them and then, you know, one or two Americans that come in. Did you find any difficulty when you're traveling around the world? I know Sam says you like to talk shit when you play. It's a fundamental (laughs) part of the game that a lot of people don't really get. Like, have you had any friction, you know, as you've gone around the world and tried to take your game with you? Uh, Yeah, as far as like adjusting and getting to know uh, my teammates, nah, that was kind of easy. Like adjusting to like the country is a different thing. Uh, I think after my first year in France, I was I was good the rest of the way, you know, as far as like adjusting to the country because I, I understood now like, all right, it's going to be different. You know, going in, it's going to be different. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but adjusting to uh, my teammates, it, it was easy. It was real easy for me because – I'm a people person, you know, uh, that just me. Uh, if you watch me and watch my game, you know, I'm, I'm that I'm the energy guy. You know? With that being, you know, big in my game, I have to, you know, be able to get along with guys. Even though I talk trash, it ain't nothing personal. I talk trash with a smile on my face, so I don't think they take it as personal. <laughs> I know I played overseas basketball and it's kind of tough. Do you feel it's kind of tough that every year you keep moving different countries? Do you feel the instability in playing overseas kind of, it gets old after a while or do you still enjoy it? Oh man, it's getting old, bro. I ain't going to even lie. (laughs) I ain't going to even lie. I think it gets old once you get a family. You know, I have my wife at home and my, and my kids. So, it, it it gets harder about that, you know what I mean? And, you know, they want you home too, so that makes it even more harder, you know what I mean? Because it's, it, it, you know, you're missing a lot of a lot of good times, especially at home, especially during in the kids' life, you know, and it hurts, you know what I mean? I got my son, just had my son, so, you know, it, it, it hurts sometimes just to see him, you know, there, or he, you know, he loved basketball now. You know, I got him a little rim, so he's shooting. And, you know, he got an iPad, so he'll call me. And he'll set the iPad up and shoot the ball. And he went, Daddy, look, 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 look at this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, it, and that and that kills you. You know, it kills your spirit sometimes, man. And, and while you over here knowing that you're far away, and it just, you know, it kills you sometimes. You, you wake up some days and be like, man, this is it. This is, I don't really want to do this no more. But but you remember that you're doing it for them, though, right? That's the yeah, most definitely, most definitely. It, it that's the that's the that's that will keep you keep you going. You know what I mean? You're like, man, I'm I'm doing this for them. You know what I mean? But it's just those times. You know, um, I remember like the first ten years of playing overseas. It's so fun. You're enjoying the travel. You're always on the plane. You're going to different country. But it, after I turned 30 and I'm in like early 30s, you're like, all right, man, this is getting old. I got to keep packing and getting on yeah. the road. And <laughs> so I know exactly what you're going through. And then, you know, I always tell players, it's, it's fun. Playing overseas, yeah. it's unbelievable no, it experience. Is. You get to see different things. Right. But then it hits you where you're like, I, I don't know if I could do this for too long. You know what I mean? I, I want to, I just want to be stable. Like I remember before retiring, I told my wife, I told her when I retire the first year, don't ask me to travel. I just want to be home for a whole year. Be home. Yeah. Little did she know I retired the next day I became a head coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually a really good segue because so for our listeners, Dar has you know, an extremely unique career when it comes to international basketball. So as he's talked about so far, he's played in a lot of domestic leagues around the world. But Dar also got to play for the Jordanian national team. And that doesn't happen very much for American-born players. Dar, walk us through that decision, right? At that point, Jordan wasn't that good. Sam was a first-time coach. And you took a chance and essentially came to play for a Jordanian national team. And you've, you are, you know, an integral part of what's now become a very respectable international Jordanian basketball team. Right. So walk us through that. And, you know, what made you want to go take ship and jump there? Uh, so I got a call. It was, uh, first Chris called me, my agent, 
And he's like, yo, what you, you think about um, joining the Jordan national team? I'm like, I don't even know where Jordan at. So I don't, <laughs> like, I don't like Jordan, Michael Jordan. I'm thinking Michael Jordan. Yeah, I, I go play for Michael Jordan for sure. But I'm like, I don't even know where Jordan at, bro. I don't like what what you mean going out there. But he was just saying national team, they want to nationalize you. I know the coach. And then it went from there. Uh I think Sam called me afterwards, explaining everything. This is what it is. I was like, cool, you know, I'm I'm with it. You know what I mean? I'll come down there for sure. Didn't know what to expect. Didn't know that basketball even existed down there. So when I got there, you know, we had a little trouble with uh with the uh what's uh with the organization. Your federation. The Federation. The Federation. <laughs> oh, that fuck. word means one thing to every single international hooper and it's not a good thing. Yeah, that look right there. Shit. <laughs> yeah. That that first federation. Federation now is pretty good. Yeah, yeah that them they're my guys right, now. Right. They're my guys. But that first one was <laughs> we went we went through some things. Yeah, we went through some things with them. But you know, I would, gradually, man, we, we I got along with the guy so well, bro. It's like real quick, you know what I mean? We became brothers real, real quick. They accepted me in. You know, sometimes with 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 foreigners coming in, you know, some some local players feel offended. You know, like, well, why would you go get them? You know what I mean? When I'm here, you know what I'm saying? Especially if he's playing your position. But man, it was none of that. It was none of that. It was all open arms soon when I got there. Uh, you got to remember, when I became the head coach of Jordan men's national team, it was at an all-time low. And I remember uh, taking over and looking at all the local players and hearing their struggle and their concerns of there's no league uh, money, there's no money, uh, they ain't getting paid on time. And I knew I, knew I needed somebody that's going to come in and energize the team and change a little bit of the culture of the team by the way he plays, by the love that he has to the game. And Dar was the perfect fit. He came in right away, didn't complain one minute. The conditions that were presented to us were absolutely awful. From hotels we were staying, the practice facilities, awful. at times we were traveling without pre money. The federation that we worked with, they just wanted to make life hard on me and on the team. And it was extremely difficult. And I give Dar so much credit because easily he could have been like, Sam, yo, I didn't sign up for this. I'm taking my ass back to Jordan. I mean, uh, to the States. This is not what I signed up for. But he stayed committed and kept grinding and grinding. And I was so happy when I got to see him perform at the World Cup and show the world what he's capable of because I saw that from the first day I met him. How hard he practiced and everything. No, man, that's, I mean... You get a lot of credit. Yeah, I appreciate I mean, that. You've put this national team on your back and you've helped us through the toughest times. And I will say these two years that I coached the national team with the three federations that I dealt with, yes, the third federation, the one that's there right now, the best out of all three, but it was extremely hard and I felt bad for the players. And I respect you and I appreciate how much you helped me as a coach to try to reach that goal. You know what I mean? Uh, so, I mean, much love. I mean, you've done a great job. Oh, man, I appreciate that, Coach. Dar, as we wrap up this part of the, the interview, you know, the crux of, of what this podcast is about is slowly breaking down that barrier of the attachment to your identity when you're a professional athlete, right? You think it's the only thing that matters and, you know, I got to play pro, whether it's basketball or football or tennis, whatever. And then you retire and you start to realize like, fuck, I didn't think about life beyond the sport. I'm only 35. You know, I've got so much time left. And this is a, this is a serious issue, right? And it's, oh, yeah. this is the reason Sam and I started the podcast. So when Sam was telling me about you and obviously I knew about you, I, I lived in Jordan for a little bit, but he was telling me that you have already started your own restaurant. Um, yep, and yep. doing something while you're still playing at a high level is extremely difficult. So first question I have for you is what motivated you to get into life beyond the sport while you're still playing the sport? To be truly honest, bro, my wife. My wife is amazing, man. Amazing, bro. You know, she uh, she really helped me out with this uh, 
the life after after basketball. You know, it. <clears throat> I had thoughts, you know, um, and trying to figure out what I was going to do, either coaching or anything, you know. She really pushed me to 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 reach out and, and try to do the restaurant, you know, because uh, I was like, I was just more so like I can just hoop and I'm going to just live off the money, you know, and I figure it out when, when the time come. But, you know, she pushed the issue like, you know, you need to you need to do something now. Like, why are you still playing? So by the time you end, you're not you're not pressured to far as like financially if something goes wrong with the restaurant or anything else it's going well so far too this is uh this is this came up with me and her you know he was like just let's do a chicken restaurant and her uncle owns a chicken restaurant so he gave us the name <clears throat> is the name is valley wings valley wings dallas so if anybody you know, in Dallas, y'all want to check it out. Come Houston, check us born out. and bred, but I'll, I'll, I'll okay. swim by once. Yeah, that's that's only four hours away. Come on through. <laughs> <laughs> that's four hours. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a chicken chicken place. Um, great chicken. <clears throat> it was just a little idea, and uh, it came to fruition, man. Uh, so with, with that in mind, and and with you know your experience already running a, a restaurant, you know while you're still hooping. Do you have any advice for any, you know, new pros, young pros that are, you know, in the peak of their career, but do need to start thinking about how to build a life beyond? Yeah, uh, be patient. That's it. Patience is the key, man. Uh, so you got patience, you'll be all right. Because uh, a lot of things, a lot of these things is is a grind. This is not a, it's not just a, you know, quick, fast thing, a quick money or anything, you know what I mean? It's it's a grind. It may or may not work, but the grind is what is going to teach you for the next, you know what I'm saying? So just just stay patient with everything. Dar, thank you for that. Um, as we enter the final section of our podcast, we're going to be calling this the three-peat. Sam and I just asking you a couple questions broadly more on life, and, and and that's how we wrap up every single episode. Are you ready? Dar, my man, are you worried about what happens when you finally decide to wrap it up and move away from the game of basketball? My biggest fear is making the right decision. I know people know say, you know, you know when you know. You know when you know it's time to go. And I understand that, and I'm sure you do, but it's just like, what else? You know, me and my wife talk about this all the time. And actually, you know, not too long ago, you know, I, I just broke down. I broke down tears because I, I, I was scared. I was scared, you know, just like, man, like, what, 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 what I'm going to really do after this? You know, and I've been playing basketball my whole life. I was playing that to my wife, like, this is all I know, like, for real. And when I look back at it, it's just like, dang, this is this is actually all I all I really know is basketball, you know? Like I said earlier, getting over the, uh, the preparation of the game, you know, once leaving, I'm always used to, you know, summertime preparing, to go back overseas. So now it's like, now I got to go all year not doing none of that. So it's just a fear of, man, like, what what, what, what am I really going to do? You know, and that's the fear. Like a lot of people said, you will know when it's time. Not really true. The only time you know it's time, when you have an injury, bro. Because I remember, I'm not going to lie, when I went into coaching, I was 36, and I uh. could still hoop. And my first, my first year, I kept guess, second guessing myself. Not too many people know about this. And I kept talking to my agent. Was I out of my mind stepping into this role? Because I kept getting frustrated because I wanted the players to do it the way I did it. The extra work, how I did it. I thought I was ready. But because you love the game so much, you love playing on the court. There's nothing like it. So even when you walk away from it, it's still tough. 
Dar, second question in this section, um, bit of a rogue one, but if your life was a book, what would this chapter be called? Growth. We like that. Little murder beats growth in the background as well, just to give it a little. little <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would probably be growth because I'm growing, you know, as a man now, you know, I'm seeing things different. Um, I'm seeing the game different. I'm seeing life different. You know, I got a lot more responsibilities now. So it, I, I can say growth, you know, is yeah. I'm really, I'm really growing as a man and I can, I can really see that. If you fast forward 20 years from now into the future, where do you see yourself and what is the ideal legacy as an athlete? I want a, my legacy to be, he was a winner. I want people when they mention me, it's like, oh yeah, like he, he can't, he can, when he comes, most likely you're going to win. You know, uh, me and my fan page, he's from Jordan, actually. A kid. Yeah, great kid, man. Great kid. He been with me since the since I've been with Jordan. So, you know, and he, he brought something up to me. Uh, what was that? The other day was saying, um, he was like, bro, you know, you know you've been to the last seven years, you've been to the finals. And everywhere, and you won four, and you won four of them. I'm like, man, like, like, dang, I never even thought of that, you know, to be, to 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 be like that, you know what I mean? And that, and that's why I want to go down as like, okay, when 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 you picked up Dar Tucker, you was gonna win, you know what I mean? I love it. You can't say it any better than that, baby. Seriously, that's the ideal way to wrap up. I just want to say for myself, thank you so much for joining us, dude. Honestly, great episode. Great to hear you speak candidly about your journey. Can't wait to have you back for season two when we figure out, you know, what that next step is. Yeah, yeah, my man, I appreciate you. Appreciate the time. It's been a pleasure. And you know what you mean to me, man. Thank you, brother. Oh, man. What a guy, Sam. Um, I'm so happy you brought him on. Honestly, there's a lot he said that I think people will will appreciate listening to. But uh, for me, I always like to hear specifically what it's like for someone, you know, born in the States to then become a sort of basketball journeyman around the world, right? It's so cool to hear how someone gets to go from Brazil to Puerto Rico to Lebanon to now representing Jordan on the international scale. And you can see how much he appreciates you and Jordan as a country when he speaks about it. So for me, that was very nice to see. What was your favorite part of the episode? Uh, Favorite part that he opened up about what's next and how him and his wife actually had that conversation and he broke down because a lot of people give you the fancy answer. You'll figure it out. You'll know when you're ready. And I agree with him hundred percent. No, you don't. And it is tough and it is, it is frightening a little bit. And I'm happy he touched on that topic and it's great for a lot of athletes. So that was great of him to open up about that topic. I agree. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like the video if you enjoyed it. Wherever you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe on that platform because it means the world to Sam and I.